Welcome everybody to our continuing study of the book of Galatians. We've titled this series, Grasping Galatians. We're referring, of course, to the book of Galatians in the New Testament. David, for me, this has been an exciting journey. I've been learning some amazing things as we've delved into the book of Galatians. Same. And as it's expanding to our understanding, we have now come to some parts of the book of Galatians that are just nothing short of revolutionary for my thinking, I think for your thinking mm. as well. We're hoping that you're eager to study the Bible, that you want to jump in with us to the book of Galatians. If you've been with us previously for this series, you know that it can be a little bit complex at times because Paul is complex, but we've been, we've been enjoying understanding what we can understand and seeing how remarkably it fits with the issues that we're dealing with today in the world we live in, in our daily lives. Now, this part of the series we've titled, this is part six, we've titled, They Want to Exclude You. Now, I could have put that in quote marks. We could have put that in quote marks because this is a direct quote from the segment of Galatians that we're going to be dealing with. And we're gonna see how it is that the people who are causing all the trouble for Paul and the churches at Galatia, these individuals, right underneath the surface, they're not revealing their hand overtly, but underneath the surface, Paul says, hey, what they're up to is they are operating on a premise of exclusion rather than inclusion. Mm. So these are the key ideas that we're about to explore in our time together. Get a Bible, get some way to take notes. We hope you'll join us for this study. This is your seat right here. We're inviting you to the table. Bring your friends, bring your family, and uh, let's just crack right into the book of Galatians after we have a word of prayer. Do you want to pray? I'd love to. Father in heaven, it has been, uh, as Ty has said here, a journey, an eye-opening journey, a wonderful journey. Lord, we are learning how to follow the line of reasoning and thinking and writing that, that Paul is, is showing us here in Galatians. And Lord, we see Paul who's frustrated, he's fired up, he's energetic, he's concerned, he's urgent. And Father, I pray that, that that would seep into our own experience, at least in terms of the energy and the urgency and the passion. Father, it's easy to become safe and to become almost kind of um, uh, calm in our journeys and sort of uh, casual in our Christian experience. Lord, help us not to be that way. Help us to contend for the faith, to study, to know, to love, and as we're going to learn today, how to be loved and be known. And so, Father, we're looking forward to a great uh, part six of our ongoing series in Galatians. Uh, may this presentation be characterized by both clarity and charity is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so for the note takers, the segment of Galatians we're looking at is chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, starting with verse 8 and going to the end of the chapter to verse uh, 20. So chapter 4 of Galatians to the, oh, well, actually to the end of the chapter, which is verse 31. Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 31. But we should probably remind ourselves of the context, the immediate context at least, and where we've come from. Yeah, so we're coming out of the first seven verses of Galatians here because when we sat down to sort of put the series together as an eight-part series, we mentioned that it was originally like... The first seven verses of chapter four. Uh, four, excuse yeah. me. But we, we mentioned, I think, that the original sort of breakdown was like 15 parts or 20 yeah, parts yeah, or something. Yeah. It, was, it was very long, and Yamil, our producer here, said yeah, no, yeah. we're not going to do a 20-part series on the book of Galatians, though I would have loved it. I would have loved it, too. I mean, it kind of feels like we're moving too fast. It but, does. But eight parts is good, and we've, we've grouped the first seven verses of chapter four with our last presentation. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't already done that, and hopefully you're just tracking with the whole series, but if you haven't done that, it will be extremely helpful to go back and listen to at least the last presentation, mm -hmm. because what we're really dealing with here in Galatians chapters three and four is the sort of center of Paul's whole argument. In Galatians 1 and 2, largely autobiographical, the Antioch incident, Paul defending his apostleship, and then in 3 and 4, this is the guts. This is the engine mm -hmm. of Paul's basic argument. And it, it goes from about chapter 3, 1 to about chapter 5, verse 1. And we're going to cover the third part then of that today, right? So mm -hmm. we've already done it in two parts. And so we're kind of beginning here in, in 4, 1 to 7, but we've covered this, but let's just remind ourselves where All we've right. come from. 
So, so Paul here is describing what, what we have called the new Exodus. All along, Paul has been using Exodus-like language, right? The language of slavery, the language of bondage, the language of liberty and of freedom, the language of redemption. And it's safe to say that, that the Exodus was never far as the sort of archetypal inaugural incident in any Jew's mind psychologically but we know from Paul's writing, not just here in Galatians, but in other places, in Romans and other passages, 1 Corinthians, uh, the exodus, the historical exodus is never far from Paul's mind. Mm -hmm. And so the language here that we see in 1 to 7 is this idea, you're no longer slaves, uh, you are now sons, God has sent forth his spirit into your hearts, that spirit cries out, Abba, Father. Uh, we reminded ourselves that when God appeared to Moses at the burning bush, uh, just prior to the exodus, the outgoing, he said, hey, go tell Pharaoh to let my son go, mm -hmm. right? Let my firstborn go. And so in 1 to 7, maybe it would be, maybe I should just read that through without read one commentary. To, yeah, just let's read do it. Read it through. Mm -hmm. And as we do this, listen for the exodus motif. Listen for the language. It's, it's quite obvious, actually. So Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, what I am saying is that as, as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set forth by his father. So also when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. That's a theme we'll come back to in just a bit, Ty. Verse four, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, under Torah, to redeem, to rescue, to deliver, to save those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, hmm. the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but you are God's child. And since you are a child, God has also made you an mm -hmm. heir. And, and just one more sort of element of, of Exodus language, there's this idea of an inheritance mm -hmm. or of an heir, right? That, that God was giving the land mm -hmm. of Canaan as an inheritance to the descendants of Abraham, which is what he had promised initially, land and descendants. Yeah. So there's all of this Exodus language going on here, and we're going to just continue this thought mm -hmm. beginning in verse 8. So, so, so just to summarize, so that, so that we're tracking with what Paul's thinking is, there's the local historical Exodus, and then there is the universal Exodus for the human race. Mm. There is Egypt and Israel, and for Paul, there is the world system as a whole and God's people, the Messiah people. Yeah. There's Moses, who is the one who is redeeming or rescuing or delivering the He's children the of Israel. He's the agent of rescue. The agent of rescue. Yeah. And then there's Christ, the Messiah, who is the agent Moses, rescue. the agent of deliverance on a universal scale for the whole human race. And, and, and really cool thought on that. Paul doesn't tease this exact point out, but it's there. That, that Pharaoh was an oppressor. Pharaoh caused fear and pain mm. and, and, and death, no doubt. Yeah. And when Jesus comes, he delivers not just geographically, not just nationally, mm. he delivers, I love your, your word there, universally, he delivers from sin and death, from the great, not the little O oppressors, mm. but from the great O oppressors. Fear, sin, death. Mm -hmm. So he truly is the Moses figure. Yeah, there's a parallel passage that that you may want to look at in Romans chapter 8 where yes. Paul uses the language of bondage again to fear, which is what David Correct. is pointing out right now. And uh, that bondage to fear, that bondage to, to anxiety uh, and, and th this more psychological, spiritual bondage that produces phobia and fear, Paul says, well, that's gone in Romans 8 because the Spirit has now taken, taken up residence in your heart by which you cry out, Abba, Father. You're not the afraid very same of God anymore. Right. You're, you're, you see God as on your side. He's for you. I am God's child. He is my Father. He loves me and I am delivered by his act. So you may want to look at Romans chapter eight as a parallel passage. Romans eight is an incredible parallel, particularly with regards to the Exodus. And I love the fact that you just said, just in the sort of stream of conscience that you were giving there, that, that God is for us. Well, that's like one of the center mm. points of Romans chapter eight. If God is for us, who can be against us? Exactly. Right, so uh, a lot of similarities there. And of course, Romans is written after Galatians, but you can see if you're familiar enough with the writings of Paul, there are many, 
themes. Um, little yeah. acorns that are yeah. in Galatians that you know. Oh, I know mm. that later in 1 Corinthians, in Romans, even in Ephesians, he's going to tease these ideas out on a, on a different scale, in a different context, writing obviously to the churches in Rome or in Ephesus. But you can see those little acorns, those little nuggets mm -hmm. in, in early Paul. And as we've mentioned already, Galatians is almost certainly the very first of the letters that we have from Paul at mm -hmm. least in the New Testament. Okay, so that's our review of our immediate context. Now there's the whole context of the book of Galatians right. and the, the larger context of the whole biblical narrative. But that's our immediate context here with verses one through seven. And now we launch in to chapter four of Galatians. You got your Bible, get your pen ready. Chapter four, verse eight. Why don't we just pick up there, David? Um, you want me to read? Mm -hmm. How far would you like me to go? Sort of. I think we just do verses eight and nine. Okay, eight and nine. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn back to those weak and miserable forces or weak and beggarly elements? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Even this has that Exodus mm -hmm. feel going back to Egypt, mm -hmm. right? Th th that's one of the sort of major motifs in the Exodus story is that they would often say, man, this is hard, this is difficult, this isn't what we thought it would be, we wanna go back. Mm -hmm. and, and Paul here asks that question, again, teasing out the Exodus theme here, you're trying to go back? Wait, you've been set free, you've been liberated, you're no longer a slave, you're now sons, why do you wanna go back? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love the language there, the weak, and beggarly elements. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so the first contrast here is between the one true God, that's in, that's in verse eight, and those who are by nature no gods. That's interesting language. What does your version say, by nature? It says the same thing, I think. By nature, no gods. So you have the one true God, you have false gods. There's an entire narrative backdrop here that we need to take into consideration because what Paul is pulling upon here is the fact that the children of Israel came out of Egyptian bondage and God said, I'm not only taking you out of something, I'm leading you into something. I'm taking you mm -hmm. out of Egyptian bondage into the land of Canaan. This is, you've heard the language, the promised land. Part of the covenant is God is saying, Israel, I'm taking you out of Egypt into the promised land, but that promised land is inhabited by the Canaanite nations, okay? Mm -hmm. And the Canaanite nations are worshipers of false gods right. that are brought to view here by the Apostle Paul. There's the one true God, Yahweh, mm. and then there are the false gods of the nations. And some of them are actually named in scripture. Uh, Marduk, Molech, Chemosh, Baal. Baal, Ishtar. These are false gods. Now, it's interesting that Paul says that these are, these are by nature no gods, by nature. That is, we oftentimes think of the idolatry of the Canaanite nations as merely a figment of their imagination. They've got little statues of wood and, and metal and Stone gold and whatever. silver, and, and there's our God, and, and there's nothing to it. Well, there is nothing to it because they're not gods, but there's something to it on another level, and that is that these false gods, according to Deuteronomy chapter 32, and according to Psalm 106, which is a retrospective review of the history of Israel yeah. by David, both of these passages and other passages tell us that these idols had demons behind them. So the, the false gods, when Paul uses the language, they are by nature not gods. These are fallen angels, reaching all the way back to the original rebellion in the heavenly courts that brought to view in scripture. There's a lot there that we don't have time to comment on. But you have, you have fallen angels who are occupying the position of false gods in the world. Let me just, let me just read a passage to you here that, would, that, that will bring to view the way the Bible writers are thinking about this history. This is Psalm 106, which I mentioned. And David is saying here in verses 36 through 38, they, speaking of the children of Israel, they served their idols, which became a snare to them. Hmm. They even sacrificed their sons and daughters to demons. 
So you have the word idols, and then suddenly David says, and these were demons. Hmm. And human sacrifice is being performed, right? And then in verse 38, 38, these are called the idols of Canaan. And these were the idols of Canaan in the land of, of Canaan, and the land was polluted by them. How was the land polluted? Well, here, one of the abominable practices is named human sacrifice. But there were other abominable practices that the, that the false gods were driving hmm. um, the Canaanites to commit. And this retrospective um, historical statement by David in Psalm 106 is, is commentary on Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is that part of the Old Testament narrative where Moses explained to the people, hey, God brought you out of Egypt, and he has chosen you as his people, and like an eagle, he's going to preside over you as his chosen people. But the other nations are divided to the other gods, and those other gods are demonic forces that are driving the people to commit immoral, dastardly, deeds, abominable practices, the pinnacle of which in these abominable deeds is human sacrifice, sacrificing sons and daughters to these false gods. That's a lot, but the point is simply this. When we come to Galatians chapter 4, Paul is saying, listen, if you don't continue with Messiah, hmm. if you don't continue with Messiah into the liberty and freedom of this new exodus, your only option is to revert back to the pagan worship practices mm -hmm. that are driven by demonic Correct. forces that, that you do not want to get back into. And this is the language, you guys, where he says, David mentioned this language in verse 9, you don't want to backslide into the weak and beggarly elements. That is to say, the practices and principles of the pagan nations that make human beings and human society impotent and sick and weak. That's the word, uh, the word there, weak. Yeah. And the word beggarly is impoverished. There's, there's nothing to it. It's, it's empty no of value. substance, yeah. right? So, so Messiah, continue with him. There's liberty that direction. There's freedom. There's flourishing. There's thriving. There's expansive. There's the promised land yeah, in front of you. The promised land. You go back, you're going back to the worship of, of demons, paganism, and the weak and beggarly elements, which he called earlier in chapter 4 and verse 2, the, the elements of the world, and back in chapter 1 of Galatians, verse 4, the present, present evil age. age. So that's a great... That's a lot. No, that's a lot. Okay. There's, there's a lot going on there, but I, I, what I'm taking away, I, I followed every point that you made there, but I think maybe for our viewers who didn't get all of that, this is kind of what's on offer here. There's no third option. There's no third option. Right? It's not like, oh, you can, you can go with the, the pillar of cloud and the, uh, the, the pillar of fire, i.e. the Messiah. You can, you can go with Yahweh, Jesus, into the promised land, into the future, into human flourishing, or you can revert back to these demonic, pagan, abominable practices, or you... No, there is no other or. Right. You can move forward or you can move backward. There's no third option. By the way, David, I, I, something else just came to my mind when you said that. We know this is the narrative Paul has in mind because later on, and we'll get to this in detail in, in a future time together, Paul, who has sometimes been regarded as an antinomian or against law, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We know that Paul is not amoral. He's definitely not promoting immorality because later on in the book of Galatians, he specifically names the abominable practices Correct. of the pagan nations. That'll be our next session. And says, hey, if the alternative to Messiah is impotence and disintegration. Yeah, when he gives that list, which we'll get to in our next session, he literally specifically names in 520 idolatry and witchcraft, debauchery, impurity, immorality. Yeah. I mean, so, so he's it's not either promoting, forward or backward. Yeah, he's not promoting sin. When, it, his, his, his earlier polemic against Torah isn't against, against Torah. It's against a misuse it's, yeah, of Torah it's not and a misunderstanding Torah. of Torah. Yeah, Paul's nuance in his thinking. He's not saying, hey, the law of God is, is bad and we need to get rid of it. 
He's saying the law of God has been wrongly applied. It's been misused. Let's put it in proper perspective. But Paul has a high moral standard. He has yeah. a high moral standard, and that comes out as the book of Galatians unfolds. Yeah, we've said before, and I really like this language, that, that God gave Torah as a guide, not a God. Mm -hmm. Right? There's only, there's only one God, as, you, as your slide said, says there. There's one true God. I mean, Paul, earlier in uh, chapter 3, verse 20, he's literally quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. God is one. Yeah, there's just right? one God. There's, there's only one God. He's quoted the Shema, which is the holiest, most important text to any Jew in the entirety of the Old Testament. And so here he says, why would you leave the one true God, the Exodus experience, yeah. the pillar of cloud and of fire, the Messiah himself who's mm. conquered sin and death, and go back? And he says it's bad for you. It's bad for you. Yeah. You will be weak and beggarly. Your life will be reduced. It won't be expanded. Yeah. You, wor you, you worship Yahweh. You follow Jesus into the promised land. And your life expands with beauty and wonder oh, and, I like that. and, and life high expands. moral bearings. You understand how things work in the, in, in the world and in relationships. You go back to the weak and beggarly elements of paganism and idolatry and everything disintegrates. I, I love the way that verse 9 starts, Galatians 4, 9, that but now. Mm. And some of my favorite verses, in fact, maybe my favorite verse in Paul also begins, but now, that's in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, but now, like Paul introduces this, yeah, it was like this, but, but now. now, and I love that, but now that you know God, and then he, he, because there weren't erasers, there weren't word processors, right, 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 you can just, in, in my mind's eye, I don't know if this was intentional, or it could have been a situation where he's dictating, and he's saying very quickly to his scribe, but now that you know God, no, wait, rather are known by God. Right. There's and, no delete and, button. And the scribe says, uh, should I just write it like that? Write it just like that. Yeah. And, and this has this feel. Listen to this passage, Ty. This sounds like 1 Corinthians chapter 8, which is yet future, but just listen to these two verses. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by Him. Isn't that something? I love this sort of orbital shift there. It, the, the primary locus of knowing is not that we know God. Our knowing of God is responsive to the fact that He knows, knows us, us, just like our faith is responsive to His faithfulness. And our love for Him is responsive to His love for exactly. us. Exactly. I just love that. But now that you know God, or, or wait, no, better yet, or rather are known by God, how is it that you would go back? Mm -mm. Right? There's nothing for you back there. It's ashes. There's beauty in front of you, ashes behind you. There's freedom in front of you, slavery behind you. That's where Paul's going to go. And with your permission, Ty, I'm going to read verses 10 and 11. Yeah, this is, this is important. Yeah, this is really important, especially for those of us that are Sabbath keepers that may have had these verses used toward us or against us as if Paul here is taking aim at the Sabbath. Okay. And so let's just have a read of this. Verse 10, you are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Now, this isn't the first time that Paul has said, I hope my labor wasn't in vain, mm -hmm. right? Have you suffered so many things in vain? If, if maybe, maybe you're going to hang in there because Paul knows that a lot of these people are on the balance. They're or on the fence. Mm -hmm. They're teetering between going with the adversaries of Paul that have come in behind him after he's returned back to Antioch. He knows this is a tenuous situation, and he identifies some of their practices, their calendrical practices, going back to these, these observances. Mm -hmm. Now, just a, a brief word here, and I'll be very interested to see what you want to see, because we haven't talked about this part yet. This sounds a little, this has that Romans 14 feel to it, too, right? Mm -hmm. The Romans 14 thing is some esteem one day above another, and another esteems every day alike. But when a Jewish person was referring to the Sabbath, they always said the Sabbath, mm -hmm. right? You know, the Sabbath was not just a day, it was the Sabbath. I mean, it was enshrined in creation. It was codified in Torah, in the Ten Commandments, written by God's own finger. And so what's not happening here is that they're going back to Sabbath keeping. We already know from our reading of Acts that the early church was, of course, worshiping on the creational Sabbath, mm -hmm. right? The biblical Sabbath. But they're clearly going back to some calendrical observances, could have been Jewish, almost certainly pagan, and well, Paul says, no, that's not the way forward. The, 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 the agitators that are coming in behind Paul are trying to get them to keep forms, to keep, of which circumcision is the greatest sign and symbol, 
And Paul is saying that's not the way forward, that's the way backward. We know that Paul has pagan uh, practices and ceremonies Correct. and days and seasons in mind because of the immediate context. Remember what he's talking about. This is an Exodus motif. Mm. He's talking about coming, Israel coming out of a pagan nation into Canaan, displacing pagan tribes in order to take up the land. And he specifically says here in chapter four, as well as the whole book, that, that we're dealing here with idolatry and pagan practices on the one hand, and Messiah on the other hand. So his immediate context here, those which are by nature no gods, that is the idols of the pagan nations. Well, in the next, in the next breath, he's talking here about, he's talking here about uh, observing days and months and seasons. He does not have in mind the Sabbath of the creation account of Genesis or of Exodus, the Ten Commandments. Yeah, and, and I, was, I was holding my breath there for just a moment because when you said he does not have in mind, and I was interested in what you were going to say, and I totally agree with you because if he was talking about the Sabbath, he would have said the Sabbath because, again, the Sabbath was not just a day. It wasn't just some, you know, random mm -hmm. event that could be kept. No, the Sabbath was creational. The Sabbath was covenantal. But, and, and I'm just going to flash forward very briefly because we'll come back to this, Paul does believe that, that Judaism as an end in itself, the, 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 the symbols and even the festivals in and of themselves can become idolatrous. Right. I mean, that's, that's a wild thing. And there's going to be this place that I'll actually come to in the next session. I don't want to run ahead. But Paul is actually going to use pagan language, and I'll show you this in our next session, to describe circumcision. Mm -hmm. Right? Circumcision was a thing that God came up with, that God gave. And Paul will actually use a very un- appealing and unflattering analogy for circumcision that's flatly pagan. Mm -hmm. so, so here's the point. If you, if you turn the symbol into the substance, if you turn the means to an end into an end itself, well, that can become idolatry right. too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That can become paganism too. And so what's not on offer here, clearly what's not on offer, as Ty has said, because the larger context here is paganism, uh, is the Sabbath. And so if anybody ever comes to you, if you happen to be a Sabbath-keeping Christian, as Ty and I uh, are, and says, oh, look at this, you observe days and months and years, the context does not support here yeah. the notion that Paul is here taking aim at the creational covenantal Sabbath. And, th and think about this, David. If, if, if circumcision was a point of of controversy that was just, just blowing up Correct. In, in that time, if Paul actually had the Sabbath in mind, yeah, there's nary a mention. The, of the entire Sabbath. New Testament would be full Correct. of controversy about the Sabbath. It would eclipse circumcision because the Jews yes. were far more obsessed with Sabbath observance and reducing it. Oftentimes, as Jesus made clear in his right. interactions I was with just the Pharisees, say, think about the New Testament. Yeah. How often Jesus found himself in Sabbath controversies. So if Paul was announcing very matter-of-factly and unambiguously, oh, the Sabbath is done away with, no Sabbath. That would have been the controversy. Mm. The controversy centers in and around, at least in Galatia, circumcision, because that was the sort of symbol of entrance into Judaism. Mm -hmm. And so the fact, it's, it sounds like a, a kind of an unusual argument, but the, one of the greatest evidences for the ongoing nature, creational and covenantal Sabbath keeping, is that the New Testament has no Sabbath controversy. Mm. It's just not there. Right. There is, there's controversy over the eating of blood. There, I mean, these, are, these were ancillary almost uh, to this. I mean, the Sabbath is central, you know, embedded in creation, written by the finger of God on tablets of stone. And so there's controversy over uh, circumcision. There's controversy over the eating of things that were strangled, over blood. There's controversy over sexual immorality. All of those things are there because these are the places where Judaism or Jewish thinking was coming head to head mm -hmm. against the sort of surrounding non-Jewish peoples and situations in the larger Mediterranean mm -hmm. world, why no mention of Sabbath? Because it wasn't an issue for Paul. And Paul, it, was, yeah. it, it was never regarded as, as idiosyncratically or proprietarily Jewish. Mm. The, what did Jesus it's say? It's a human institution. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for anthropos, for mankind, yeah. which goes all the way back to creation. Okay, mm. I just wanted to say that about the Sabbath because I think that people can get derailed. They can just have somebody who doesn't know Galatians, who doesn't mm. know the larger biblical context come and say, look, 
You, if you are keeping special days, months, or whatever, the, the Sabbath, you're going back. Right. And people who are uninitiated and who don't know the larger narrative of Scripture, they would go, uh, and they'd be flat-footed. Yeah, they just see the word day, and right. they think it must apply to the Sabbath, and it most certainly does not. It doesn't. And, and again, if you want further explication of this idea, go read Romans 14, where Paul does speak about days for feasting and fasting, but here again, clearly not talking about the Sabbath. Right. Okay, you happy with that, yep, time? Yep. Okay, now we go into this like sort of, I don't want to say autobiographical, but pastoral section. Mm -hmm. Paul is just going to step momentarily out of the theology that he's been in, Exodus, mm -hmm. motif, traveling, you know, pillar of fire, all of that. He's going to just step out of that for a second, and Paul is going to, is going to speak now to people whose names he knows, whose homes he's eaten in, whose houses he has visited. Mm -hmm. He's just going to open his heart to them. Um, I'll read, you just tell me when to stop, Ty. I'll read a few verses here. Verse 12, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Wow. I mean, first of all, one thing I just want to say at the outset here is Paul is invested. He loves, he loves, he loves these, these people. people. Yeah. Yes, that's what I was just going to say. He loves these people. This is not for Paul an academic exercise. He's not like, well, you know, whatever decision they make, that's on them. No, 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 no. Paul is invested. Mm -hmm. He's in the trenches. And he... He reminds them of the times they've shared. Hey, become like me. I became one of you. Right. I went to your homes. I visited you. I ate with you. I had an illness. Now, this is an undisclosed illness. He doesn't give the exact nature of it, but Christian tradition, and I think there's very good reason to believe it, probably had something to do with his eyes mm -hmm. because he says as much in the text itself. But why would Paul say, if you could have given me your eyes, you would have given me your eyes if it wasn't something with his eyes? Right. And Christian tradition has held that when... Paul encountered the risen Christ on the road to Damascus and he was temporarily blinded that there was mm -hmm. some residual effects of yeah. that. A little bit like, like Jacob of old when he wrestled with the angel and then the angel touched him, when Christ, uh, the angel of the Lord touched him, Jesus, and his, uh, his hip went out of socket. The New Testament says in the book of Hebrews that for the rest of his life he walked with a cane. Yeah, yeah. So it, as a continual reminder mm -hmm. of his weakness and mm -hmm. of his encounter mm -hmm. with the living God. And so Paul reminds them of that because in the ancient world, and we know this from John chapter 9, that any kind of sickness, but especially blindness, was perceived as a curse from God, as being disconnected from God, as obviously having upset a God or the gods. Mm -hmm. And so if, if, this, if this messenger of the one true God comes to town and he's preaching this great news message and he himself is significantly visually impaired, that would have caused a lot of people just, you know, at first blush, you know, it, right. the, the sort of prima facie evidence that this guy is not in the favor of God and couldn't possibly have a great message from the one true God is he himself has an illness. Mm -hmm. He himself has an infirmity. And he says, but you didn't treat me that way. Yeah. You, you didn't just look at the outside and evaluate. You listened to the content mm -hmm. and I, you received me as if I was Jesus himself. Yeah. We were in fellowship and you can sense that Paul's He's hurt. He's like very much so. You're believing these these false teachers. Who are these people? Who are these people? I'm Paul. We had fellowship. We're connected. I think you should take seriously what I'm telling you over what these guys are telling you, whoever these guys are, because after all, we have history. We have history together, and it was sweet fellowship that we had in that history. So why are you turning away from me? Why do I not have credibility with you? Hmm. I'm, I'm just reminding myself here, I was quickly flipping through. Remember that when, when Paul was, I mean, Acts chapter 14 here, when Paul, he had been in Antioch and Iconium, and then he went to Lystra. And when Paul went to Lystra, he was mistaken as one of the gods of the, of the people of Lystra, the oh, Lyconians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, the gods have come down to visit us. And remember, Paul runs into the midst of it. This is the very churches that he's writing to. This is, they would have known this story. Paul tears off his clothes 
and says, no, we're not gods. We're men just like you. And then they're like, oh, what? You're not gods? And then they stoned him. Mm. So, so Paul knows that these people, these might have been the very, the people to whom he's writing, I shouldn't say might, were some of the very people that would have cared for Paul in the wake of his being almost stoned to death Mm, when mm. he was stoned, they thought he was dead. Mm -hmm. They drug him out of the city because they were done with him and they killed that strange foreigner who was, you know, mocking their gods. And then Paul miraculously and wonderfully revives and the people to whom he's writing would have been some of the very people that nursed Paul back to life, mm -hmm. back to health. So when Paul opens his heart to them, they know his bruises, they know his body, they know his infirmities, and he opens his heart to them and says, what are you doing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are you thinking? How can you be turning back to the weak and beggarly elements? We're going forward with Jesus, not back to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so are we tracking here? So, so we've, got, we've got the one true God versus yep. the false gods. Paul then associates the false gods with the weak and beggarly elements of the world. I just love that language. Yeah. That's such great language. Isn't it? Isn't it? And, so and there's an association, though. The false gods are the source and origin of this, this, th this, this anti-flourishing way of being. And I want to say something about that. We don't live in a context where the ancient Canaanite tribes, you know, are worshiping little bits of wood and stone. And, mm. but, but there are demonic powers at work today, and there are idols at work today, and there are false gods at work today. And we should not think for a moment that we have outgrown. It's not like Satan said, okay, well, I'm done. He's just become more subtle. He's become more clever. He's, right. He has become more suggestive. And I, I just want to say anything that has our highest energies and our highest devotions that's not the one true God of Scripture and his son Jesus mm. is a weak and beggarly element. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to prognosticate about the degree to which those things are demonic or not demonic or the degree to which... You know, I don't want to get into you know, the speculative, did they make a deal with the devil or any of that. I'm simply saying it doesn't even really kind of matter no. if there are specific demons behind these ideas. It's the ideas themselves that are dangerous, not the demonic presence. Mm, mm. And so we either go forward with Jesus or we go mm. back into whatever your specific preferred flavor of the weak and right. beggarly elements is. You know, just imagine you get to a gelato place there and there's the one true flavor Right. right, that's the Messiah. And that's, we know that's strawberry. <laughs> <laughs> that's strawberry. And then you have all, I mean, there's just, there's innumerable options right they've now. They've ruined the ice cream as you move from strawberry. They've got <laughs> mint and they, they've got pistachio. You are, you are no got, fan of mint. <laughs> no. Can I tell you a story? Only in toothpaste, Only. but I don't want to taste it. Yeah, ever. You, you hate mint <laughs> as, as eating. Can I tell you a story? One time I went into a, a what do they call them, gelateria or something, or mm. one of these gelato shops, and they had wasabi ice cream. This is wrong. I know. So I, <laughs> I said, whoa, wasabi ice cream. I, that sounds terrible. And the guy's like, yeah, it's a little weird. He said, do you want to try it? And I made a big mistake. And tried it. I said, and sure. Then you couldn't Give me a little your... scoop. And he gave me a little scoop. And the moment I put it in my mouth, I regretted it. Yeah. Because I like wasabi, and I like gelato, but, but that's a bad combination. Oh, it gets worse. Wasabi, then there's cotton candy, oh, ice stop. cream. Forget just it. it. Just no, let's but, just... the, but the point is, there are, there are literally innumerable, I mean, just uncountable mm. options in the world today that you can worship, that you can give your loyalty and attention to. And Paul would say, if those have your highest loyalties, yeah. your highest energies, and your highest attentions, you're effectively returning. Yeah to the weak and beggarly elements, rather go forward with Jesus there are, into human flourishing. There are countless versions of the same thing. Correct. Great. Countless well versions said. of the same thing. So then Paul says those weak and beggarly elements will lead us into bondage, yeah. back into Egypt, so to speak. That's the language there. God has always been working on the premise of, of promising the land to the people over which he would be the one true God and Paul is saying, but the world is haunted by hostile forces yep. that are trying to take the land, corrupt the people, and preside over the world as, as gods. gods. And they are by nature no gods. I love he that says. line. Don't yeah. you love by that line? By nature no gods. Ooh. And then we come to this part, David, as we as we continue on. Uh, where did you Verse leave 17. off? Verse 17. 
Yeah, yeah, verse 17. So I'll read 17 down to 20? 17 to 20, and then here's, here's some key language. Those people are zealous to win you. That word zeal is an important word in context. Mm -hmm. To win you over, but for no good. What they want is to, here's my translation, to alienate you from us. What they want is to exclude you so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I'm with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth mm -hmm. until Christ is formed within you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Mm. I'm astonished, mm. he said in the mm. first chapter. That's one of the first things he right. said. I marvel, I'm astonished. Mm. There's some great language here. So yeah, the key language that, that, that I think needs to be emphasized is that these false teachers who have come from Jerusalem, Paul is exposing their underlying motive here, whether this is a conscious motive that they are you know, deliberately uh, enacting, we don't know. But Paul discerns mm. in these people that really what they're up to, my version says, that they are zealously courting you. They're like, come on, come on. He uses come the word on, zeal three on, times Come, on, there. come, on, come yeah, over here with us, come they're with us. They're courting, they're courting the Galatians not merely to them, but away from Paul. Yes. Th so these are people and who And Paul's are primary concern is that away from Paul because Paul- Is with is, Jesus. Paul is preaching the true gospel that he learned through the revelation of Jesus. Mm. If this isn't an insecurity on Paul's part, they're leaving the gospel, yeah. they're leaving Jesus. Yeah. Go ahead, I, I just so, wanted so, to point so, that out. So, so Paul says, hey, what they're really up to as they're flattering you and courting your, your, your relationship with them is, is they're seeking to alienate you from me and to exclude you from the larger messianic covenant promise. They want, and from the community. They, they don't want you on the inside. They want you on the outside in order to continue the system of, of exclusionary Judaism. Us and them. That has been going on all along. In group, out group. Mm -hmm. Okay, I love that. And now it's, it's coming clearer and clearer why Paul told the story of the Antioch incident, mm -hmm. right? We, we, can, we can speculate, I think safely speculate, that Paul records that incident because it seems likely that the report of that incident, I mean, this is a pretty significant clash between two of the most significant leaders in the early church, Peter especially and Paul who was on the come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would have, mm -hmm. word about that in the churches would have spread. So we can, I think, safely speculate about that. But one of the other reasons that Paul tells that story, and maybe the primary reason, is that what was happening there? Exclusion, mm -hmm. right? There's, a, there's an in-group and an out-group. Yeah. There's the ones that belong at the what we call cool kids table, and there's the ones that don't belong unless you capitulate to this, 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 and this, chiefly among them, right. circumcision. Right, right. And so when Paul says they want to exclude you, he's tapping into the very idea of the Antioch incident that, that God has two families, that God has two tables, that there's the ones that are in and the ones that are really in. Mm -hmm. And this is what makes Paul's conclusion there at the end of chapter three so significant. If you are baptized, you are Christ's and you are heirs according to the promise. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. You are all one in the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so when Paul says here that they're trying to exclude you, it's introducing that, uh, he's saying, look, this is exclusionary, not inclusion. Mm -hmm. And so it makes a lot of sense now why Paul was getting so much mileage out of the Antioch incident and why he told the story the way that he did. Mm -hmm. so, so we could say that legalism, legalism is a charged word that, that can be understood to mean more than one thing, but legalism, we're using the word here in the sense that Paul is describing going back to the law as the means through which you have covenant acceptance rather than through Messiah's faithfulness yeah, okay, to good. the human race. So legalism drives exclusion, division, hostility, and us and them ism. And this is, this is replete throughout the book of Galatians. Paul is trying, Messiah is trying, and Paul through the preaching of Messiah is trying to pull people together around one table as one family of God, one, one Messiah, Abrahamic one family. One God, one yeah. covenant. It's all together, and these individuals from Jerusalem, these false teachers, are trying to say, no, there's two tables. Let's keep, there needs to be a line separation. of demarcation. There needs to be a separation Man. here. They're trying to keep the old hostilities 
of Judaism well said. alive. So earlier I talked about how there's these little kernels, these little acorns in Galatians that you know Paul in later writings will further explicate. And this has got Ephesians 2 all over it, mm -hmm. right? The middle wall of partition, right. he broke it down, making the two one. This has got that all over it. And I just want to remind us of something, not in Ephesians, but in Galatians itself, back to the Antioch incident where Paul gives Peter that rebuke. One of the things that he said, and I know I've said this again, but I'm going to say it a third mm -hmm. or fourth or fifth time now. Paul says, if I erect the thing that I tore down, which right. was a misunderstanding of Torah as an exclusionary tool, if I erect that, the front of the sign says, Jews only Gentiles mm -hmm. keep out, mm -hmm. there's the exclusion, uh, exclusion, but the back of the sign says, you also are a transgressor. Mm -hmm. You have not kept Torah either. And so the fatal flaw in the call of Israel, not God's flaw, but the fatal flaw in the whole, the, the fly in the ointment, was that Israel themselves were infected with the disease that the rest of the nations were infected with, which is why they need a single God, a single Messiah, a single promise, mm -hmm. and a single table mm. for a single family. Amen. Amen. David's I'm preaching. preaching. I'm preaching now. That's Come right. on. Okay, so in, in the time that we have left, David, this is a crucial oh, yeah. part of Galatians. And, and this is the section where Paul basically tells the story of Abraham. He, 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 just, he says Abraham had two sons, and, and, and there's a story here. And again, we can, we can speculate as to why Paul tells, is always on about Abraham. And I think the primary reason, I don't even think this is speculation, is that the Abrahamic story and the Abrahamic covenant is the story of Scripture. Mm. But it seems likely that the adversaries of Paul or the enemies of Paul were using Abraham and perhaps even using the story of Isaac and of Ishmael to leverage it. And here again, Paul says, okay, okay, you, you want to talk about Abraham? You want to talk about Sarah? Yeah. You want to talk about Isaac? You want to talk about Ishmael? Let's do that. And Paul does something that's a, it's a little complex mm -hmm. at first pass, even second pass, but the takeaway is incredible. And uh, with your permission, I'll just get right into yeah, it. Yeah, let's just read it. Uh, verse 21, tell me, you who want to be under the Torah, are you not aware of what Torah says? It, Isn't that good? That's already, you know, a bit of a flex. Yeah, and he's, <laughs> he, and he's feisty. He's like, you, you, you want to talk Bible? I got Bible. R read me verse 21 in the New King James. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you not? This has that sort of Jesus overtone to it. Yeah. When they'd come to Jesus and say, hey, what's this or what's that? And he'd say, well, wh what does the law say? How do you read it? Yeah, he's like, you want to come around here quoting scripture? <laughs> Sit down. I'll quote some scripture. All right. Those of you that want to be under Torah, do you hear what Torah says? And then here we go. Verse 22. For it is written... And he's going to be back in Genesis chapter sort of 16 to 21 here. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. Mm. So just let's fill in the blanks here, Sarah and Hagar. Mm -hmm. His son by the slave woman, Hagar, was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. Let's this just pause there. Ishmael, Isaac. Ishmael and Isaac. How is it, we've already talked a little bit about this when we talked about circumcision, which is Genesis 17. How is it that Ishmael was born? Well, Sarah came to Abraham, made the suggestion. That's a story that I won't get into right now because there's something going on there. Mm -hmm. There's a dynamic there that's fascinating. But Abraham capitulates to Sarah's suggestion, lays with Hagar. Hagar becomes pregnant, gives birth to Ishmael. Sarah is scandalized by this. She's, uh, she's unhappy because in my opinion, I think she thought, I'll just say this briefly. I think that this was Sarah's idea because Sarah didn't think that, they, they knew that it took two parts to make a baby. Right. And, and, and Sarah, I think, is performing a mild scientific experiment here and saying, <laughs> well, how about if you sleep with her? And in her mind, if she she's doesn't not get, get pregnant, pregnant, you're the problem. You're the problem. But, yeah. what, but when she does get pregnant, then now she despises her because yeah. the thing has gone south. Now, I don't... It doesn't expressly say right. that, but you can sort of read between the lines here because what woman goes and says, hey, I got this great idea. Why don't you, <laughs> why don't you sleep with that sweet young thing? Right? right, because she was just a young slave girl. Right. Sarah was an older woman. Beautiful, though, the Bible says. And so now Ishmael's born. Mm -hmm. And Ishmael, according to Paul here, is a son of the flesh. Mm. Uh, the flesh. In other words, this was Abraham. This didn't require any promise or any divine intervention because men remain, you know, virile and, and fertile till late in life. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's nothing supernatural here. This requires no promise, mm -hmm. requires no divine intervention, mm -hmm. um, which is why that's Genesis 16. In Genesis 17, God says, as snip, we've already snip. discussed, snip, snip. <laughs> Not only will you be an old man with an old wife, now you're going to have wounded genitals and I'll still keep my promise. Mm. 
So far so good? Verse yep, 24. Yep. These things are being taken figuratively. Paul says Symbolic, now, my yeah, version says. Symbolic or allegorically here. Now, Paul not that is, they're not historical I was events. I just going to say, Paul is not saying this is not an historical event that actually happened. He says, let's, let's see if we can learn any lessons from yeah. this. The, woman rep the women rather, represent the two covenants. He's wow, like, oh, wow, this, wow, uh, wow. I know, wow. I know, I know. <laughs> it's like, what? Where okay. are we going? One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Mm. Now, the Sinai thing is fascinating, which we'll come back to. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. That's a bombshell. Mm -hmm. Verse 26, but the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. For it is written, and then he quotes from Isaiah 54, be glad, barren woman, and you who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud, mm. you who were never in labor. This is Isaiah 54, but this Jewish rabbinical interpretation said Isaiah 54 is about Sarah, and it's easy to see why they would have thought that, mm -hmm. because Sarah's actually mentioned in Isaiah 51, mm -hmm. and then here in Isaiah 54, you have a formerly barren woman that's got this miraculous child, and everybody's happy, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. So we'll just pause right there. Okay. This is rich. <laughs> this there's, a, is there's a lot here. Incredible. Paul, Paul, Paul is saying, listen, there, there, there's a history, there's a story, and that story forms the premise for understanding two covenants, two relational dynamics that are on offer. There are two ways that you can perceive and relate mm. to God. Yeah. And those two ways are bondage or freedom. I think it's likely, I can't prove this, of course, but I think it's likely that, that those that came in behind Paul must have been leveraging this story and the Abrahamic story more generally to try and say, hey, are you really a child of Abraham? Well, because Abraham, he was circumcised. He was circumcised. Yeah. And so Paul here takes this likely argument that's being raised by those that mm. were his antagonists. And he flips and it. And he flips it and he says something fascinating. Now, Ty, I'm gonna put you right on the spot here, if you don't mm. mind. Something that might make some a little uncomfortable is this idea there, because it all, it, it, it flows nicely and easily mm. and there's a couple points I wanna make, but I wanna ask you this question just straight out. When he says the one covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves, this is Hagar, it seems like we have a bit of a mix here because Sinai was originally the place where those that were free were led to out of Egypt. Right. So these aren't slaves, right. they're free people. So how does Paul here make the seemingly uh, incongruous analogy that, well, Sinai represents those that are slaves like Hagar mm -hmm. and the Jerusalem that is above represents those that are free, the promised mm -hmm. child like Isaac. So I think we know what Paul means because of 2 Corinthians chapter three. <laughs> So, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, which came later, Paul actually expounds on this, and he again brings up Sinai, and he specifically mentions the law written on tables of stone. Mm. For those who are familiar with, uh, with this controversy down through church history, um, Paul is not an antinomian. He's not saying that the Ten Commandment, the Ten Commandment law given at Sinai itself produces bondage. In mm. fact, the Ten Commandment law given at Sinai begins with a declaration Freedom. of liberation, yeah, right? Amen. So he's not, he's not an antinomian, he's not against the Ten Commandment law, but he is saying that, that the way Israel interacted with the giving Correct. of the law is a covenant that is weak on the human side, Correct. which he brings out in Hebrews chapter eight, Hebrews chapter 10, that God made promises and the people entered into covenant with God and the people's promises to God were like ropes of sand. They were depending like Abraham was on the flesh for, Ooh, good, yeah, good, they good were tie. depending on the flesh for keeping their end of the bargain. They should have centered their attention on God's liberation, God's faithfulness, which would have produced in them an, a, a new covenant experience in the old covenant period, right? right? Beautiful. I, I, you know, the, 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 the language there 
of Israel at the base of Sinai was not the language of humility or of self-distrust. All that the Lord has said, we yeah. will do and obey all his commandments. Exactly. The next thing you know, they're dancing around the fire, worshiping the golden calf. Correct. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's exactly right. And so we've noted before, as, as Paul said in, in what, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, that the law is great. Torah is great. The Ten Commandments are great insofar as they're used, used lawfully as they were intended. That's right. To the degree that they're used incorrectly. And that's why Paul can say, that's the punchline here. That's why Paul can say Sinai is analogous to slavery. Mm -hmm. Sinai is not analogous to slavery. Paul knows the Bible extremely well. He knows that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land yeah. of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You will have, Paul knows all of this. In mm -hmm. fact, we have to be so careful that we don't make the Paul of Galatians 3 and 4 contradict the Paul of Galatians 5 when we get there, there's right. going to be this extremely high ethical standard. We'll right, get there right. in just a second. All of which are violations of the Ten Commandments. Here's what's no oh. Let, let me just finish my point. Yeah. But the way that Torah right. is being used in this situation as an exclusionary tool, as a tool of access and of status by virtue of my compliance with external regulations mm -hmm. written on tablets of stone, yeah, that is slavery. Yeah. That is slavery. That's what, what's not happening in this passage is what is referred to in popular Christian language as dispensationalism. The popular idea that uh, has, has really uh, done a lot of damage is that in the Old Testament, Old Covenant, God was actually saving people by law keeping. In the New Testament, in the New Covenant, oh, now Jesus came, so God is saving people by grace. That dichotomy, that bifurcation of two different ways that God is saving people is completely a false construct, Correct. right? God always was relating on the premise of his faithfulness to the people, Correct. his liberating act that was based on Passover deliverance. He was always relating to the people on the premise of what he could do for them, had done for them, Amen. and would continue doing for them. Salvation is always centered in God's saving act. Never in scripture are people saved by law keeping during one era, one dispensation, and then saved by grace in some other era. Mercy. Anybody who is saved is saved by grace Thank you. through faith in Christ alone. So, so the way dispensationalism sees a fundamental discontinuity between the Old and the New Testaments, thematically, theologically, yeah. methodologically, we don't see a discontinuity. No. We see absolute continuity. We see that the trans, yes, it's amazing. It's, it's radical, it's mm. tectonic, that God became a man and shows up in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah, yeah that's a game changer. But, yeah. but the message doesn't change. I don't the, even the, like the, the idea of, I don't even change. like the idea of Old Testament, New Testament. Time. If you, if you, look if at this, you look can at this, just look at rip out the look page. At this. The, the only uninspired page in your Bible is the page that comes between Malachi and Matthew. <laughs> That's and, right. And I dislike that page so much. I have a, I've always done this. I fold that page over in my Bible. Because <laughs> I love that. Are you I'm going to fold it over it in mine. Because there's no point. There's no, there's no point. It's a continuum. The first verse of the New Testament continuity. says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Yeah, it's just, it assumes that yeah, you know the stories of David yeah. and of Abraham. Yeah. And so this idea that there's a disconnection between the two is... And Theologically so, and methodologically and it, absurd. It's so deeply embedded in, in Christian thinking that people literally think it's a good idea and have done this for hundreds of years to print, print New Testaments. Yeah, just print the New Testament. Just print the New Testament and hand it out. What are you, what are like you supposed to make like of the, the New Testament if you don't the have movie. the old? Yeah, yeah. There's a two-hour movie. We're going to show you the last 30 minutes. Yeah. Well, the New Testament begins with referencing Abraham and David and the children of Israel. Correct. How are you supposed to make sense out of it? So, okay, so. so there's a point I want to make here. Paul drops a bomb right in the middle of verse 25. Okay. He says, now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. That's a bomb. Th that is a bomb because Jerusalem occupied this giant space psychologically in the minds of all Jewish people. The temple is there. That's the center of Judaism. It's where, where so much of Jewish history has taken place in mm. and around Jerusalem. And for Paul to say, Jerusalem, literally the city of peace, is now enslaved. I mean, they were like literally enslaved because yeah. they were under Roman. They were, they were allowed to exist with a series of sort of 
you know, exemptions, mm. but they were in slavery, mm -hmm. and Paul uses, and this would have been a particularly biting point for any in Galatia that were Jewish in audience. This would have hurt them, mm -hmm. right? In, in the same way that, uh, uh, to use an illustration, not too long ago we had September 11, the 20th anniversary of September 11. As an American, when I think about September 11, when I see those images, it's deeply distressing it's to painful, me. Painful, yeah. Because people that, that look like me and, and people that talk like me and people that live in the same country, that, that happened. Right, and so there's this identification. Okay, that is only a, a fraction of a fraction of the identification that a Jew would have had with Jerusalem, remembering that the first temple was destroyed and now the second temple is rebuilt and you're under the oppression and the purview of pagan powers. Mm. So for Paul to say, the current Jerusalem's in slavery would have stung. It would have stung. It would have stung, but it's true. And he means theologically. Mm -hmm. if, if the church in Jerusalem, and not just the church, but just Jerusalem generally, has lost their Messiah, they've crucified him, they've turned from him, they're not following him, he says, you know what they've done? They've gone back to the weak and beggarly elements. Because Messiah showed up in the saddest verse in all the New Testament. He came to his own, and his own received, his own him, received him not. Mm -hmm. and so that's a bomb. This just occurred to me. That would have landed very heavily. Th this, this just occurred to me. Do you think there's something, something additional going on here as well, where Paul is very specifically associating current Jerusalem, very current, because previously in the book, he says that these false teachers are from Jerusalem. 100%. They've come from James, from 100%. Jerusalem. No, 100%. He's, taking, he's making a, a, a point here that the, the teachers that have come to you that are causing confusion, that are spying out your liberty, those guys from Jerusalem, well, they are with Hagar. They are with Ishmael. They are not yeah. with Isaac. They are not with Abraham. They are not with Sarah. Well, we could, we could go even a step further, which would be outside of the bounds of this study. But Paul is aware of the great prophecies of Daniel 7, 8, and 9. Hmm. Paul knows what's going to happen to Jerusalem. Paul has, is familiar with the teachings of Jesus. He knows that Jerusalem is not going to last. I mean, this is why there's, I think, uh, totally reasonable speculation that Paul was the author of Hebrews. He is trying to get their minds mm. off of that temple, that priesthood, that city, mm -hmm. because it's coming to an end. And so for Paul to take a little dig here, a totally justified dig at Jerusalem, I mean, this is the Jerusalem that Jesus himself said. He, 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 oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one that stones the prophets, no. right? How often I want, so, so for Paul to say this is absolutely an unambiguous reference to those who had come from Jerusalem, and he's basically taking the sort of prestige and the position that Jerusalem mm. occupied in the Jewish mind. He's demoting it. And he's it. saying, no, 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 no. The Jerusalem that matters, he says, is the Jerusalem that's above. Come on now. And, that's, and, that's where, and that Jerusalem above, uh, it corresponds to freedom, freedom, to Sarah, to Isaac, to Abraham, to Messiah. Correct. 28. Oh. Okay, 28 through 31. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. Mm. Woo, come on now. That's an announcement. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? And now this is really the punchline of, I mean, Paul is almost getting to the very point of his whole argument here. Mm -hmm. What does Scripture say? And he lets Torah say, for him, what he's saying to the churches in Galatia. Mm. Kick him out. Yeah, <laughs> cast out. That's, what it is. That's the message. Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman and the son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. I mean, literally, yeah. the punchline of yeah. Paul's argument up to this point, I mean, this is really the climax. Kick them out. Yeah. Well, he and had... don't get circum... We'll come to that in the next chapter, but kick them out. Yeah, he had, he had said earlier, anathema. They're under oh, a I'm curse. I'm so glad you brought that back. So Paul here has brought those early anathemas, mm. those early curses, all the way back in uh, 6 and 7, 8, mm -hmm. Genesis 1, 6, 7, and 8, where he says, you know, cursed, and, and if they preach a gospel other than the gospel I preach, and, and he's really not mentioned a lot about these adversaries until here. Yeah. He didn't say much more about it in two, nothing about it in three, and only now at the end of four yeah. does he finally say, here's the punchline, 
kick him out. Yeah, he's not pulling any punches. He's saying that the false teachers are promoting a false system, that they are anti-covenant, anti- Anti-unity. Anti-unity. They're pro-exclusion, they're anti-inclusion. I mean, Paul could have just said this at the outset. Hey, kick these guys out. But he goes through this incredible, tells the story of the Antioch ex incident in chapter two. Then he goes through this incredible, mm. fast-paced, energetic, highly persuasive scriptural argument. And when he comes to the climax of the argument, he says, now do what you mm. know is the right thing. Mm. Kick them out. Yeah. Well, we hope you guys are enjoying this tour de force study of the book of Amen. Galatians. We're talking kind of fast at times. We're covering a lot of material. But again, this is a Bible study, and you are a Bible student, or you wouldn't be tuning in for this. And, Amen. And uh, these are not sermons. So we're asking you to, to look at the text with us. We hope that you'll continue doing that. Uh, we have now covered part six. We have two sessions to go as we complete the book of Galatians. And uh, we just really appreciate the fact that you love scripture and that you are joining with us in this study of the word of God. Uh, David, shall we close with prayer? Yes, yes, we shall. And, and, and uh, something I want to say, when we, when we come back into that next session, I have a, a our next sermon, I want to, our next sermon, our next Bible study, I have a specific question I want to ask you. I'm going to put you right on the spot. I think you better tune in for so that. You want to tune I don't in even for know that. what it is. Yeah, it just came to me. But we'll close this one, and at the beginning of the next one, I'm going to start, Ty, by asking you a tricky question. All right. Father in heaven, we love you and thank you. Lord, what a message. The Jerusalem that is above mm. is free. And Father, we do not want to be children of the flesh. We want to be children of the promise and of mm. the spirit. Mm -hmm. now, Father, we know that through the announcement that has been made available to us by you, by Jesus, that we are sons and daughters. And Father, this isn't just something that we've invented. You tell us that your spirit comes into our hearts. Mm. Your spirit says in us and through us, back to mm. you, Abba. Abba. Father. Father, you are our God. Mm. And so, Father, we don't want to go back to the weak and beggarly elements. We don't want to go back to the various accoutrements of modernity and the idolatry that are presented there. Father, idolatry, whether ancient or modern, is all going to result in ashes and slavery and bondage. Father, lead us forward. Teach mm -hmm. us how to live in the light of your love. And Father, forgive us where we are tempted at times to turn back to Egypt. Help us to say forward with Jesus, forward with our Father. Mm. And we just think, Father, that as we get our minds around Galatians, this ancient book, is providing so many practical, modern opportunities for us to apply uh, this ancient letter. And so help us to do that by your spirit and bring us back for our next session is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.